So welcome everyone to our February um, our February lecture for the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum's free monthly lecture series. We have um, amazing presentation today by historian and author Jack Kelly, but before we get to him, I am just going to um, say a few words about this program and thank our sponsors for this program. First up, my name is Angie Grove. I'm the executive director at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. I am almost on my two year anniversary. So this is uh, maybe my 10th or 11th lecture series and uh, the first one on Benedict Arnold. So I'm excited to learn about this infamous man. Uh, so our monthly lecture series is part of our larger community enrichment programs in which we have a book club, we have reenactment events, we do field trips, and lots of other different programs um, that help the community um, have historical enrichment and education in their lives. Our community enrichment series is sponsored by some community organizations, including MNT Bank, uh, North Country Federal Credit Union, and Vermont AARP. So thank you to them. And our monthly lecture series specifically um, is also had, grateful to have the partnership of TV, also known as Town Meeting TV, who records the programs and then makes um, accessible on Town Meeting TV showings as well as on our YouTube page so that we can reach a broader audience and bring historical enrichment to more people. So thank you to all of our partners and the sponsors of these programs. Okay, I am going to turn over to John Devineau, who is our recent past president of the Homestead Board of Directors, and he's going to introduce today's speaker for us. Um, oh, one more technicality, uh, technical thing. If you put anything in the chat box, I will be monitoring um, the chat box there. So if you have questions during the presentation, you can put, put them in the chat box to save for the end of the presentation, and I'll be going through those questions. Um, at the end, if you want to ask your question live, you also have the opportunity to do that as well. Okay, over to John. All right, thank you, Angie. Welcome, everyone, and a special welcome to our our viewers, uh, our attendees from out of state today. I know we have several. Uh, we are really pleased today to have Jack Kelly with us. Jack is an award-winning historian and novelist. His books about the revolution in early America include Band of Giants and Valcor. Kirkus Reviews described his latest book, God Save Benedict Arnold, in the following way, is the true story of America's most hated man. It's a dazzling addition to the history of the American Revolution. The Wall Street Journal said that the book, quote, propels readers into the brutal action with vigorous prose and sentences that are often short and pugnacious, much like Arnold himself. Jack has received the DAR History Medal. He is a New York Foundation, he is a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow in Nonfiction Literature and has appeared on NPR, C-SPAN, and the History Channel. He lives and works in the in New York's Hudson Valley, and he promised us earlier today that he's going to come to the homestead. Uh, later this summer. So with this, Jack, it's all yours. Hey, thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you, Angie. And uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, it, it's always great to talk about these events in the places where they ha happened. And <clears throat> much of Benedict Arnold's career really happened in the Champlain Hudson Valley. Um, everybody knows Benedict Arnold. <laughs> Um, he's probably the most well-known soldier of the Revolutionary War, uh, other than George Washington himself. And everybody that knows Benedict Arnold knows one thing about him. And I don't have to say what that is because you know what it is. But I wrote the book uh, in, in, in part because it's a great story, but also to get across the idea that there's more to Benedict Arnold than that one thing. And it's really important to understand Arnold in order to get a clear picture of the Revolutionary War. My book is not a biography of Benedict Arnold as much as a uh, making the case for him. It's like a manifesto about Benedict Arnold. 
I sometimes think of it as Benedict Arnold's greatest hits. So the Revolutionary War began on the morning of uh, May uh, 19th, 1775, when the um, red coat shot and killed eight Minutemen at uh, Lexington Green, and the Patriots came back and they killed more than 70 of the King's soldiers, and the war was on. Benedict Arnold, two days after the news of Lexington ar uh, arrived in New Haven, Connecticut, where he lived and had a very successful uh, trading business, uh, two days later, he was on the march uh, towards Boston to join the war. He was very enthusiastic um, and one of the most avid uh, soldiers to, to march off to war at that time. Three weeks later, on May 10th, Arnold captured one of the most strategic fortifications in the 13 colonies at Fort Ticonderoga uh, on Lake Champlain in northern New York. And he not only captured the fort, but he um, went up into Canada on his own initiative without orders from anybody and captured a warship that was the only warship that the British had on Lake Champlain at that time. So he thereby secured Lake Champlain for the Patriots. Um, the question then arises, was this an important achievement of Arnold? And I think it was in part because the strategy of the British during the first two years of the war was to gain control of the water corridor that ran uh, down the Richelieu River, Lake Champlain, Lake George, with a little um, portage over to the Hudson River, and then all the way down to New York City. This was the superhighway of the co colonies, and the British felt that if they gained control of that water corridor, they would um, be able to split the colonies, isolate New England, and win the war. Um, so the obstacle to that achieving that goal was Fort Ticonderoga approximately in the middle. And in particular, the, the Patriot control Lake Champlain. And I'll, I'll talk in a minute how that hampered the British, uh, in putting their plan into progress. But in addition to that, um, there were a, a, an abundance of cannon at Fort Ticonderoga the Patriots desperately needed, and they very famously put them on sleds and the following winter uh, hauled them across the entire state of Massachusetts. And that gave George Washington his first victory, uh, allowed him to, to force the British out of Boston. Uh, that was a, gr a great achievement of uh, his head of artillery, Henry Knox. So between the uh, stopping the British invasion and, and getting the cannon to Boston, it seems like this is um, um, a very important achievement. So we have to look at the history books and see what they say about it. And it's barely a footnote. The capture of Fort Ticonderoga is, is usually mentioned and just passed over. And the credit, when it is given, is often given to Ethan Allen. Um, Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys, of course, as I'm sure most of you up there know, uh, the Green Mountain Boys was a, a vigilante group that Allen had gotten up before the war that really didn't start out having anything to do with the dispute with Britain. And uh, the uh, Allen and the Green Mountain Boys did provide the manpower for the takeover of Ticonderoga. Um, but as soon as the excitement was over, the, the Green Mountain Boys basically went home. Uh, Ethan Allen... Um, had a controversial, uh, uh, to say, put it diplomatically, a controversial role in the Revolutionary War. Um, and in fact, the idea for taking over the Fort Ticonderoga was Benedict Arnold. The leadership was Benedict Arnold. And I think most importantly, the initiative to gain control of Lake Champlain was all Benedict Arnold. So that now leads to the question, do we owe it to Benedict Arnold to get the history right? And I don't think we do because um, Benedict Arnold was certainly a traitor and there's nothing in my book that in any way exonerates him. In fact, I think his treason was uh, actually much more serious than some people think. 
Uh, so we don't owe him anything, but I think we owe it to ourselves to um, to get the the uh, iron out the discrepancies in history, because Benedict Arnold is a paradox. He was both a hero and a villain. He was a um, someone who was devoted and really devoted to the to the patriot cause, and then tried to destroy the revolution later. And that's not an easy thing to to get your head around to to, to understand. And so, from beginning when immediately after his treason was uncovered, there's been attempts to um, sort of iron it out and and just say, well, he was just a traitor all along, and his accomplishments were ins insignificant, or his participation was minimal, or his motives were were suspect. Uh, some of the early biographies even said that he was a nasty little boy and made up stories about things that he'd done as a child, which were totally fabricated uh, to show that he had been a traitor from the cradle. So I think it's important to understand that paradox, to understand that he actually was both a a, a, a really important hero of the revolution and 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 an, uh, uh, our worst traitor. And partly it's because that's the truth of history, and partly it's because there are many paradoxical figures uh, all through our history. Uh, if we just think of the Revolutionary War, there's people like Aaron Burr, Ethan Allen himself, um, General Charles Lee, Horatio Gates to some extent. These were people, they were, certainly didn't go as far as Arnold did in betraying the cause, but they wavered or they had doubts or they um, acted out of self-interest uh, and they were complicated. And that's really the way history is. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, we can get past the Parson Weems type of history where George Washington never told a lie. Uh, we can see that all people are complicated, and some are much more complicated than others. And the, those who are have the type of paradox that Benedict Arnold had uh, can be dangerous, and Ar Arnold certainly was dangerous. So we jump ahead to 1776, and now we see why the capture of Ticonderoga was so important. The British uh, goal that year was to bring a 7,000-man army over to Canada come down the Richelieu River, down Lake Champlain, and uh, down to at least to Albany and, 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 and get control of the Hudson River. Um, but they couldn't do that because if they were to move that army down towards Fort Ticonderoga, now controlled by the Patriots, they would have been subject to uh, uh, attack by gunboats like this. This is a replica of the, of the gunboat Philadelphia that was built by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. And um, th th that would have, uh, the, the troops in the British troop transports would have, would have been able to be blasted out of the water. So the British had to build their own fleet of armed ships up in uh, Canada in order to protect the troop transports in order to get the army down to Ticonderoga and, and, and in, uh, continue on their invasion. So they began an arms race that summer with uh, Benedict Arnold in control in uh, charge of the uh, nautical defenses of Ticonderoga. It was down here in Skeensboro, uh, today is Whitehall, at the very tip of southern tip of Lake Champlain, building more gunboats, more small sailing ships armed with cannon. And the British were up here in St. John's with a, a lot more resources, a lot more expertise putting together a small fleet of, um, of uh, warships, but with a lot more guns and a lot more power than, than what the Americans could muster down in the other end. That went on for all summer. In August, Benedict Arnold took his small fleet up to the north end of Lake Champlain, waited for the British, and he waited and waited, and all through September, no nothing happened. They continued to build ships. They wanted to have overwhelming firepower when they finally did come down the lake. But the delay was to prove to be very consequential. Uh, at the end of September, Arnold pulled back to Valcour Island here and 
had there was a protected bay between Valcor Island and New York Shore, and he waited some more for the British. It wasn't until October 11th the British finally came down the lake, and when they uh, Patriots found out the size of the fleet that they had and the amount of uh, firepower. Uh, Arnold, second in command, said, uh, "We got to get out of here. Well, this is this is suicidal to stay here." And Arnold said, "No, um, I have a plan. We're going to fight the Royal Navy and we're going to beat them." And uh, he was so confident and and so uh, keen in his strategic thinking. Um, that uh, his captain supported him. They they lined up for battle. And his strategy, this is a contemporary m map of the battle. This was the American line in the north. The north end of the bay was uh, closed off because it was too shallow for ships to come through there. So the British had to come around. And a lot of their, a number of their bigger ships weren't able to get up in there. They couldn't tack back and forth enough to get through that narrow opening. This line here represents the British gunboats, which they had many. Uh, and uh, the, the battle basically came down to American gunboats firing at British gunboats. Very brutal form of warfare, um, uh, point blank cannon range firing back and forth. Um, it went on for seven hours. The um, It got dark, the battle ended, and the Americans were still standing. The British had not been able to break through that line of ships, but they'd expended three quarters of their ammunition. Uh, the the um, many of their boats were damaged. So now what? Again, Arnold said, "I have a plan," and because of his foresight, they were able to escape from that trap of the bay in Valker Island directly through the blockade that the British set up to the south. Uh, in the middle of the night, very quietly, they were able to slip away. It was all, almost like a fairy tale. There was more fighting down the lake. The um, majority of the Br American ships were destroyed in all that fighting. But the outcome was that by the time the British got their army down to Fort Ticonderoga, it was almost November. And uh, the British were afraid that the lake would freeze before they could take Fort Ticonderoga, and then they'd be stuck there. They wouldn't be able to get back, and they wouldn't, couldn't go on. So they decided uh, that um, they would go back, try again in the spring. So the campaign of 1776 in the North was a complete success in the sense that it uh, uh, stopped that British invasion. And if we ask then, was it an important achievement? All we have to do is look at the other end of that water corridor down in New York City. George Washington had already lost the, in August, he lost the uh, the largest battle of the entire war in Brooklyn. He was forced out of New York City in September. Uh, he was forced over into New Jersey and then retreated all the way across New Jersey um, to Pennsylvania. His 20,000 man army had shrunk to 3,000 men, and he wrote a letter to his brother at that time saying, I think the game is pretty near up. And it would have been up, and I think it would have been curtains for uh, Washington if he'd also had to contend with a British invasion coming down the Hudson River. But instead, because of the success in the North, um, Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates, who was the commander of Ticonderoga, came south with more than 600 men uh, and marched them out to join Washington's army in Pennsylvania. So some of the men who fought at Valcour Island also crossed the Delaware in Washington's famous Christmas night attack on the Hessians in Trenton, his greatest and most consequential victory. Um, Benedict Arnold was not among them because he'd been sent off on another assignment, but... Uh, the, his men were, were there, and he was able to get them down there because of the success he'd had. So uh, what do they say in the history books? Well, I can't say it's just a footnote because uh, this book, uh, Valcour, the 1776 Campaign that Saved the Cause of Liberty, came out a couple of years ago, which I wrote myself. 
Um, and it's, it's a pretty good book. I, I, I would recommend it. And um, I was surprised, though, when I was doing the research for that book of how little had been written about the Northern Campaign. Uh, it's just something that had slipped through the cracks in many of the accounts of, the, of that very crucial year in 1776. So we jump ahead to uh, 1777. This is Benedict Arnold's house in uh, New Haven. It had one of the biggest houses in town. And um, he had come home uh, after a long, uh, many, many months of campaigning uh, in order to take, take a rest. He was on leave there, and he decided to resign his commission. He thought that he deserved uh, uh, promotions for his success at Valcour, uh, which he didn't get. George Washington supported him, but uh, then, as now, uh, the the main main promotions in the army were made by Congress, and there was a lot of politics and just general um, confusion in Congress as to how to handle the military, and and they ref not only refused Arnold his promotion, but they promoted junior officers over his head, which was a slap in the face to any officer. So he decided to uh, resign and have done with the, the, the war. He wrote out his resignation. He went down to Philadelphia and he turned it in in July of 1777. By coincidence, on that same day, news arrived in Philadelphia that Fort Ticonderoga had fallen. Uh, General John Burgoyne had now brought that 7,000-man army down. Very little opposition on Lake Champlain, uh, easily took Ticonderoga, and was on the march toward Albany. Arnold forgot about his resignation, jumped on a horse, rode up to join General Gates, who's now in command in the north. Together, they decided to meet uh, Burgoyne at Bemis Heights uh, on a high ground just just beside the Hudson River and a few miles south of the village of Saratoga, which today is Schuylerville. They fought two battles there, collectively known as the um, Battle of Saratoga. Um, in, the first, in both battles, uh, General Burgoyne tried to sweep around the left end of the American lines, and in both battles, uh, Benedict Arnold commanded the left division. Uh, in the first battle, he fought Burgoyne to a standstill and inflicted pretty heavy casualties. And in the second battle, um, he decisively defeated Burgoyne and uh, then personally led a charge into the British field fortifications, um, broke through, and put Burgoyne in a position where he had to do what he said he would never do, which was retreat. Benedict Arnold was severely wounded in that uh, battle with a bullet through his leg. But 10 days later, Burgoyne had to surrender his entire army to, um, to General Gates. So if we get to the question, and was this an important achievement, it's referred to as the turning point of the Revolutionary War. Time magazine at one point said that uh, they estimated this to be the most important single battle fought anywhere in the world in the last thousand years. So it sounds pretty important. So what do they say in the history books? Well, they can't deny that it was important. So there's been a continuous, in, in almost every account of the Battle of Saratoga, uh, some attempt to diminish the contribution of Benedict Arnold. Some of the stories were he was drunk. Uh, some said that he um, that he had been relieved of his command. He was pouting in his uh, cabin. Uh, he was never on, on the battlefield or, well, they had to admit that he, he must have been out there at some point because he got wounded. Uh, he was just riding around like a madman. He wasn't, he wasn't managing the battle. Um, those stories have over time gradually been debunked. And, and I think there, there's even been a, there was recently, uh, about five years ago, a, a new, some new evidence that came out that, uh, 
really clarified. And I, I think today a lot of historians, uh, probably most historians would agree that Benedict Arnold really was the essential man in that very essential battle uh, that, um, that changed everything in the Revolutionary War. Three years later, in 17, we come to the one thing that everybody knows about Arnold, which was that um, he committed treason. He went over to the British. This was an effigy of him uh, that was dragged through the streets of, uh, of Philadelphia after they found out. Um, and of course, the question is immediately is, why did he do it? And there's been many reasons uh, proposed and talked about. A lot of historians have um, their favorite reason. Um, some said that it was all about the money. Um, some said that it was his wife. Uh, he'd married Peggy Shippen, who was a loyalist-leaning young lady from Philadelphia, and that she influenced him to do it. Some said that he didn't like the alliance with, with the French that they developed uh, after Saratoga. Um, some said he was just disgruntled over the, the still over the, the, the uh, Congress's uh, treatment of him and the, and the promotions he didn't get. My own answer to that question was why, why he went over to the British is, I don't know. I think Benedict Arnold is a very enigmatic character, very hard to hard to penetrate and to look into his mind and see what uh, he was thinking, what would have had so, so much weight that it would force him to make this 180 degree change. Uh, and I sometimes wonder if he knew or if he could have articulated himself even why he did it, but he certainly did do it. And because he never did anything by halves, he gained command of the lower Hudson Valley. Uh, he asked George Washington to give him command of this. Uh, uh, he was still suffering from his leg wound and didn't feel he could uh, be out in the field. So he uh, uh, had first been in command of Philadelphia, and then they moved him up here to uh, the southern uh, Hudson Valley, which included... West Point, uh, a very crucial fort. It was not a military academy then, of course, but it was uh, a, a fort protecting the, the Hudson River. And he offered to the British to um, to let them uh, take over uh, West Point, which they had wanted to do for years. And he was going to make that possible. So the unfolding of that plot was, is one of the great dramas in American history. Uh, he met on, in September of 1780 in Haverstraw, which is on the west side of the Hudson River, with the head of British intelligence, Major John Andre, and uh, gave him uh, a map of the fort, uh, information about troop deployments there, other documents. And uh, Major Andre uh, was the, the go-between for the, the plot. Arnold then went home back to his headquarters, which was on the east side of the uh, Hudson River, opposite West Point. And Andre, uh, after some delay, uh, found himself uh, riding on horseback down the east side from the Peekskill Ferry, down the east side of the Hudson River. And he got almost down to Terrytown. He was very excited, and he was very nervous. And he was excited because he had... Um, accomplished really the greatest intelligence coup of the war that was going to completely make his career, probably make his life by um, making this arrangement with Arnold. And he was nervous because this area of um, Westchester County was no man's land. It was uh, below the American lines, but above the British lines that were down near closer to New York. And it was patrolled by both loyalist and uh, and Patriot militiamen, uh, Major Andre was in civilian clothes, riding along. Sure enough, three men jumped out of the bushes, stopped him at musket point. And then uh, Andre made the mistake of saying, I hope you're of our party. And so one of the militiamen, who was probably not as dumb as he looked, said, uh, oh, yeah, what party is that? 
at that point, um, Major Andre had to guess. So he said the lower party, meaning the, the, the British down in New York, and the militiamen said, we're Americans, get down. They searched him. They found him documents. They couldn't, they didn't know exactly what he was up to, but it was very suspicious that he'd have this map of West Point and the other documents on him. They, he offered them bribes. They refused the bribes. Um, he then, uh, they took him over to their commanding officer, Colonel Jameson. Uh, I think Colonel Jameson was a little slow on the uptake because he, um, the first thing he did was to send a letter by courier to his commanding officer, Benedict Arnold, explaining this, this suspicious activity down in his district. Um, he thought about it then the next day and he's going, well, wait a minute, this is Benedict Arnold's handwriting. Um, I'm not sure what, how to take the, all of this. I'll send the whole thing to, to George Washington. So he sent another courier off with the documents and another letter, uh, to George Washington. The twist in the plot comes in because George Washington wasn't at the American camp over on the New Jersey border, but had gone out to Hartford, Connecticut to meet with some French officers. He was on his way back to camp, and he was scheduled the next morning to have breakfast with Benedict Arnold, and to, they were then going to go over to inspect West Point together. So you have the tense situation where um, you got two couriers. The second courier had found out that uh, where Washington was going to be, so they were both headed towards um, Arnold's headquarters. George Washington also headed towards Arnold's headquarters from the north. Who was going to get there first? Some of Washington's aides arrived at Benedict Arnold's uh, house, said uh, the uh, Washington's just up the road, get ready, he'll be here in a few minutes. Then one of the couriers arrived, handed a letter to Arnold. Arnold read it. He said to his wife, I got to go. And he told everybody else, he said, I'm go going over to West Point, tell Washington to wait. He ran down to the boat launch on the Hudson River, jumped in his boat, and told his crew to row as fast as they could to the south. Meanwhile, Washington arrives at his headquarters. Um, Arnold's not there. Where is he? He's over at West Point. Okay, Washington says, we'll go over and um, do the inspection now. They go over. He takes the whole, his whole entourage over to West Point. Uh, the people there haven't seen Arnold in two days. So uh, Washington says, that's a little puzzling. He looks around the fortifications that Ar Arnold had supposed to be, have been building up were actually still falling down. The, a lot of the men had been sent away from West Point. There wasn't enough men to defend the fort. What was going on? So Washington later described his own thinking at that moment. He said, my mind misgave me, but I had not the least idea of the real cause. And I think we can all identify with that feeling. It's like, there's something wrong here, but I, I just can't put my finger on what it is. So being uh, the un unflappable George Washington, he went back to Arnold's headquarters and decided to take a nap. Before he lay down in bed, another courier arrived and handed him a letter with the documents. He looked them over, he immediately knew what was going on. He called in his, um, his most trusted subordinate, Henry Knox, and he said, uh, Arnold has betrayed us. Who can we trust now? And it was not a rhetorical question because uh, Washington at that point didn't know who was involved in this plot and how far it went. So he sent Benedict, he sent um, Alexander Hamilton racing down the Hudson River on horseback to try to catch up with Arnold. He sent a message over to the army in, uh, on the uh, west side of the Hudson to start marching troops up to West Point to protect the fort. And then the real drama began. Arnold's wife, Peggy, former Peggy Shippen, now Peggy Arnold, um, 
And this, by the way, is a drawing of um, Peggy that was done by Major John Andre. He was quite a pretty good artist, and uh, this was back when the uh, British were in control of Philadelphia, and um, Peggy was flirting with the British officers. She started tearing her clothes off, screaming that she had to see Washington, that they were going to kill her baby. Uh, she was having an hysterical fit, they thought. And so the officers gathered around, tried to comfort her, and uh, they didn't suspect that she could be so devious that she had been in on the plot all along and, in fact, was um, putting on the scene in order to help her husband escape. And he did escape. He got made down the, to a ship on Hudson River, um, went to New York City, was made a brigadier general in the British Army, spent the next year fighting against Americans for the British, wearing the red coat himself, after Yorktown, went over to England and never set foot in America again. Um, a few days after, oh, um, of course, Major Andre, this is a, a portrait, a self-portrait by Major Andre, um, drawn while he was waiting for his trial, which happened about a week later, uh, and he was then immediately hanged as a spy. The three um, militiamen who um, captured Andre and re refused to uh, accept his bribes received what turned out to be the first military decorations in American history of these uh, silver medals with the word fidelity on them, of course, in contrast to the lack of fidelity by Benedict Arnold. A few days after the plot was discovered, one of um, Arnold's um, aides said that uh, wouldn't it have been better if the bullet that went through his leg at Saratoga had gone through his heart? And historians down the years have re sort of echoed that sentiment uh, a little differently by saying that if Benedict Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, um, he would be remembered as one of our greatest military heroes. And I think from what I've talked about here this afternoon that you can, you can see the logic of that idea, but I don't think it's true. I think that if Benedict, Benedict Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, he would have been forgotten. In the same way that um, Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox and Richard Montgomery uh, and all the great military heroes of the revolution have largely been forgotten by the general public. Um, I live in, in the Hudson Valley, as I mentioned. We have Greene County, uh, Montgomery County is nearby, Sullivan County, Putnam County, all named for heroes of the revolution. Uh, but you ask people, uh, who, who's the place is named for, they're not really that clear about it. So I'm hoping that as we come up to the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War, which is fast approaching, that uh, some new attention can be paid just to the men who did the fighting. Uh, we're going to remember Benedict Arnold, of course, but what about all the others who stayed faithful? and particularly the men in the ranks who went through a great deal of hardship in order to create a country. Um, if you read the uh, letters and diaries of that time, you occasionally come across the phrase that they, they felt that they were fighting for freedom for generations unborn. They use that phrase. And we are those generations. And they were fighting for us. So thank you very much, and uh, I'd be happy to take a few questions. I have a um, website, jackkellybooks.com, where you can sign up for a newsletter. I set, keep keep you abreast of what I'm doing, and also occasionally send out a, a, a an essay on history that you know some people have found interesting. Uh, and you can pick up the book at any bookstore or online service. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, 
Okay, so we're now opening the floor to any questions. You have a couple of different options. You can either use the raised hand function in Zoom. You can turn your camera on and physically raise your hand so I can see you. You can put a question into the chat box. And if you put it in the chat box, I'll assume you want me to read it out loud. But if you want to read it out loud, you could make a comment when you type it in to the chat box as well. So uh, we're going to start, Jack, with a question that was submitted during your presentation into the chat box. This question is from Glenn. There's two parts to the question. So the first question is, have you watched Turn, Washington Spies? It's a TV series which depicts Arnold's personal life and his relationship with Washington and his treason. If so, does it portray him accurately? If you haven't seen it, there's a second question. Okay, I have seen that. And I, um, I, I think they did a very good job, both in the production values, which were, were, were very well done, I thought. And, um, and also uh, in the depiction of Benedict Arnold in the general facts, I mean, there's always going to be in any kind of dr dramatic uh, series like that, there's got to be drama and there's got to be romance, of course, too. And uh, there was plenty of that. And they made a, a, the, a, the mileage out of it uh, in depicting his uh, his love affair with uh, Peggy and um, the various ins and outs of it. Um, the, the I guess the one thing that that kind of always bothered me though is I had read so much about Benedict Arnold and seen what portraits there are of him. And I had a picture of Benedict Arnold and the guy who uh, played Benedict Arnold did not fit that picture. And I was, that always grated on me a little bit while I was watching it, but I, I was really impressed by that series. I think it's, uh, I, uh, it would be great to see more series that are done that well and that stick as close as they did to the to the facts, even though they had to um, put in a little element of melodrama. Yeah, my memory of that series is he, uh, it, the way he came across to me was a little bit of a pretty boy by the guy they had him acting for it. Um, it was that how you viewed it? Is that what didn't match up to your view? Uh, I don't, it, it, it's hard to even put my finger on what it was there was something about it. he just didn't look like the way i imagined benedict arnold looked he was he seemed too tall and not um i always imagine benedict arnold is a little shorter and more uh athletic uh, appearing but I, I don't he did a pretty good job i, I i'd say but uh, just it, it doesn't always fit with your the image you create in your mind yeah uh, for those viewers who may not be familiar with the series, I believe it was AMC maybe that did the series. Yeah, so it's something you so. might you might be able to find it online um, to watch it again. And I would I recommend it. Okay, there's a few other questions that have come into the chat box. Um, if we have time, we'll get to the the second part of Glenn's question, but oh, oh, we'll, well, we'll get whatever. to some of other people's questions first. Okay. Um. So John Devino asked. I assume. Well, he. Okay, we're going to turn this into a question. Are there any letters in which Benedict Arnold shared his thoughts about why he joined the British? Uh, yes, actually, um, there are very few personal letters left uh, that Benedict Arnold wrote, but he did write a public letter only a few days after the, the plot was discovered, which he called to the inhabitants of, of America, which was I thought was a funny way of addressing his countrymen, but he said to the inhabitants of America, and he gave a whole list of reasons why he did it. And uh, it was the French uh, alliance was on the top of that list. And he didn't, he said he was never, had never been for independence. Uh, he thought, and basically the basic message of it, besides listing all these different reasons why he went over is that he he didn't feel he was committing treason he felt that he was doing what was right for the country as he had done what was right when he first committed treason against the king now he was committing treason against the cause but it was because it was the right thing to do so um whoa. Technical issue. <laughs> i'm seeing something else here um uh, so that was uh that letter uh turned out though that he Arnold didn't even write that letter. That was written by a, a um, 
a gentleman named Smith in New York, who was the, the British uh, Attorney General of New York at that time. And uh, it was pretty much a standard uh, loyalist uh, propaganda points. Uh, it didn't have a personal sense of this is what really moved me to do it in any case. And uh, and Arnold didn't really write it either. So uh, that was that was the only explanation that ever came out of him. And uh, he lived the rest of his life just either thinking he'd done the right thing or he wasn't going to talk about it. So. Thanks, Jack. Right. Again, um, I'm going to keep going through questions in the chat box, but if you have a question you'd like to ask on video, just raise your hand in your camera or use the raise hand function in Zoom if you don't have your camera on. Um, okay, so another question from the chat box for you is from Kevin. Kevin said, I'm reading Gore Vidal's historical fiction about Aaron Burr. Burr fought under Arnold in Quebec. Can you comment any further on the connection between the two people, if there was any? Uh, yeah, the, uh, I, I didn't go into in my talk into the uh, expedition to Quebec, uh, but um, Arnold led a, a second army, the, the main army uh, in the invasion of Canada, which happened in late in the fall of 1775. Uh, was led first by Philip Schuyler and then by Richard Montgomery and actually took Montreal uh, and got up as far as the city of Quebec. Uh, Benedict Arnold uh, was sent by George Washington up into Maine where they he took a thousand-man army over the mountains of Maine in, in boats uh, going up the Kennebec River and then walking from there. And they, they actually got to Quebec first very uh, uh, tortuous uh, expedition it really put a strain on Arnold's uh, leadership abilities. And he, he came through, he was able to get the whole army up there. There was no roads. They were just walking along trails to get over the mountains with all their equipment. Um, and then um, tried to attack or had hoped to attack Quebec, but it, it just, it, it, it didn't work. They didn't have any cannon with them. That was their main detriment. Uh, so um, Aaron Burr had signed on. He was a young, uh, I think still in his teens at that time, Was uh, had been a student at Princeton and signed on as a volunteer. And that was like, they did a lot of the clerical work. The volunteers were uh, like aides. He followed um, Arnold to, to Quebec. Uh, and then was sent down to uh, make a connection with Montgomery as Montgomery was leading the main force up the uh, St. Lawrence River. And Burr then joined with Montgomery. Burr, I think, was a very much tended to be a, a career looking out for his own career. So that was a good career move. He figured now I'd get up to the, the guy who was the commander, not Benedict Arnold, who was, was uh, Montgomery's subordinate. And he joined him, and I don't think they had much to do with the, the two of them, uh, Ar Arnold and Burr, had much to do with each other um, after that, during the war. Uh, of course, Aaron Burr ended up, I think he was tried for treason, too, so uh, they had that in common later on. You're correct, yeah. Yeah. Um... So um, in addition to uh, Kevin, who just asked that question that included Quebec, uh, Rich and Glenn had also asked about Quebec. Um, and so you've commented some on it. Uh, so to follow, to add on to Richard's question also, um, he asked about Maine, which you briefly mentioned just now. So is there anything else you'd like to add about Quebec or Maine, since there seems to be a general intro? Yeah, I, 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 it's understandable. A lot of people come, to, and, I, and I myself ha, I remember reading, and a lot of people I've talked to uh, have gotten up their interest in Benedict Arnold when they originally read the books by Kenneth Roberts, who did a, an enormous amount of research. His books were fictional, but they were based on very, very solid research of that expedition uh, and um, the the um the the hardships of that expedition and so that was um uh, many of the men that did that uh, went over uh, on that expedition kept diaries and uh, roberts actually collected all his diaries and published a book that included all the diaries so he got very minute detail about what happened and it was 
it was hard to believe what they went through to uh, in terms first of just the difficult climb wading in ice water all day pushing boats up loaded with equipment and then ran out of food about halfway over and they didn't have enough food to get back they didn't have enough they didn't know what was coming when they got over and uh then they started to starve to death and uh some of them did and so it was uh, uh a rough and these these guys would they said they they're wet all day they would lie down on the ground their clothes would freeze around them during the night and then they'd get up and shake it off and another day of hauling equipment so it was uh, it was quite a expedition was compared to hannibal going over the alps wow so uh not from the same exact battle but the people in the audience here might be interested in knowing about the homestead book club next book discussion is on um it's called The Fort by Bernard Cornwell. It is historical fiction, but as Jack Kelly just mentioned, steeped in research. And uh, it is about the Penobscot expedition up in Maine in 1779, so kind of a similar story. So if you have any interest in that, um, you can check out the Homestead Museum's website, um, which you can purchase the book from our online gift store and participate in that discussion in May. Um, okay, uh, speaking of books, Robert is asking, Jack, have you read James L. Nelson's book, Benedict Arnold's Navy? And Robert would recommend it to everyone here. Yes, I uh, I found that that was a great book. Uh, and um, it went into the um, both the invasion of Canada and then uh, it, it gave a good context for everything that happened at Valcour Island as well. And he went into the, the Valcour Island the building of the boats on uh, Lake Champlain. So I, 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 I definitely recommend that. M my book was much more focused on Valcour Island and just the, just the Lake Champlain um, end of that story. He, he uh, told a, a much broader story in that book, but uh, definitely well worth reading. And Jack, the, your book that you're talking about, is that the Valcour book? That's yeah. Thinking? That's called that's just called Valcour, the the 1776 campaign that saved the cause of liberty, uh, and that goes into more a little more detail uh, about the campaign. I mentioned it in uh, God Save Benedict Arnold as well, but uh, um, as part of the bigger picture in that book. Yeah, we'll have to get that book in our online gift shop as well. We have God Save Benedict Arnold, but I'll I'll order some copies of Valcour. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very much uh, Lake Champlain oriented uh, story. Yeah. Okay. There's a, a question in the chat box from Tim. Uh, do you feel that the rivalry between Arnold and Gates has been overblown in previous historical accounts? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, that's a, I'm glad he, uh, Tim asked that question because uh, it's part of the story of Saratoga, which was that. Uh, Arnold and um, Gates had worked together all through 1776 in the summer, Gates at Ticonderoga and Arnold building the fleet on the lake. When Arnold came back, he joined um, uh, General Gates, now in total command in the north, and together they fought the Battle of Saratoga. Between the first battle, there were two battles about two weeks apart, and after the first battle, they had a, a very hot dispute over Arnold felt that he didn't, didn't get enough credit for what he'd done in the first battle when Gates uh, reported it to Congress. Uh, Arnold, uh, that was all through his life, he was very prickly character, he was very sharp to defend his honor. That uh, dispute was, was recorded in great detail by aides to... Uh, Arnold and an aide to General Gates, who was James Wilkinson, who was a young man, educated young man, did a lot of the paperwork for Gates. Those aides were very uh, partisan. The, the Arnold's aides were were all friends of Philip Schuyler. Philip Schuyler had been pushed out of the command by Gates. They hated Gates. Wilkinson was protecting Gates and didn't like Arnold. So they t kind of 
instead of trying to soothe things down, they they fomented the dispute. It got into the record because they wrote a, a lot of letters back and forth. And people focused on that as showing that Benedict Arnold wasn't in command, uh, that Gates had pushed him aside, that he had been relieved of his command, et cetera, et cetera. I think it was overblown, and I think it was overblown because it, so much of it was recorded um, in the, these writings. And that in fact, it was um, it was a passing thing. They were both very under huge amount of stress. Uh, they had this dispute, and then it passed over, and they worked together at the Battle of Saratoga. And the uh, the information that I talked about called the Bachelor Letter was found on eBay in seventeen and in, in, in uh, twenty sixteen, uh, written two days after the uh, battle, at, uh, the second battle of Saratoga, uh, by a New Hampshire militiaman to his wife, and it was a, a genuine letter, new information from Sarat about the battle of Saratoga, that showed uh, Arnold and Gates cooperating. Uh, that's been accepted by most historians now as uh, a strong indication that the the older story of the the dispute and the and the uh, fact that Arnold was not in in command at Saratoga is um, is been debunked. So it's it's always interesting as history does continue to you know surprising two hundred and some years later that still new evidence is coming up. Absolutely. We run into that at the homestead all the time where, um, yeah, it's, there's still new things that we're learning about history every day and right. the people in the story. Uh, okay. Another question in the chat box. Well, actually, this one's a comment. Uh, Robert Ruff Rock said, many people don't realize that the first sloop Enterprise fought in the battle of Valcor Island. Thanks, Robert, for sharing that. And Robert Compton asks, how was Arnold received in England after England lost the war? Yeah, I was. I was actually. I just mentioned that that first comment. I was impressed myself because the Enterprise was a name uh, that went down through the American Navy um, very prominently all through history, and that was the first ship that was called Enterprise was uh, was one of the early ships that Arnold had gotten on Lake Champlain. Um, and the, as, as far as what happened after, um, he went over to England, uh, he and Peggy both moved over to, to London. They were re rewarded by the British government for what they tried to do. Peggy got a stipend herself for her participation in it. Um, their sons, they had, I think five sons in England, uh, were all made officers in the British army, but they weren't well received and uh, in particular, Arnold wanted to get back into active military service. He loved the military. He loved the, being in in the in the in the mix in the war, and uh, the officers of the British Army uh, hated him, but partly because he was a traitor. And even though he'd come to their side, uh, they still considered him a traitor, untrustworthy. And partly because he he had killed a lot of British soldiers, uh, you know, as an American officer, so they would never they always blocked his efforts to get back into a military command uh, in England after he went over there, and uh, he got back into business. They lived for a while in Canada. Um, he was never very happy, um, and they lived fairly comfortably, uh, but not uh, it was not a. I think the the life of his dreams, but uh, uh, certainly better than many of the people that he, uh, uh, you know, what really always, uh, when I say his treason was more serious than, than people think, he betrayed people he had led in battle, American soldiers. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just that he betrayed the cause or changed his mind about the cause he actually led British troops that killed Americans. And that was, um, you know, a blot on his reputation. I think that will never be erased. Thanks, Jack, for answering that one. 
Um, so I have two more questions in the chat box. We probably have enough time for maybe three or four more questions total. So if you um, have a question that you're sitting on, now's the chance to, to raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Um, so the question I'm going to give you now is from John Devineau. Uh There are no statues of Benedict Arnold for obvious reasons. Um, John admits he has not been, he has not visited the Saratoga battlefield, but he's heard a rumor. Is it true that there is a monument of a boot to recognize Arnold being wounded there? Yes, that, that was, uh, I think, correct around 1900. Um, and it's a, it's a stone monument that just shows a boot and a, a cannon, I think. And it describes Arnold and his achievement there, but doesn't mention his name. And uh, it's, uh, I was talking to somebody that said they remember that when they went to the battlefield as a child, they thought that was the most interesting part of the whole battlefield is seeing a monument to a boot. But um, that was the way of, that they had of acknowledging what he'd done uh, without, without acknowledging him, essentially. So uh, he's been... There, there was a, a, a something called cancel culture, what, what we now call cancel culture, that, that started really in the Roman times when they would, some emperor or some military officer would be disgraced. They would erase everything, all records. They would, ch you know, chisel out his name out of all uh, plaques and everything, destroy all statues. That was... The, and they had a word for that. I can't remember what it was in Latin. Uh, that's what was done to Arnold. He, everything about Arnold was erased except for the uh, um, often very spurious accounts of him and the biographies that um, indicate indicated how, how bad he was. So there's the only place I could find. Uh, first, there's a, actually Arnold Bay down on Lake Champlain um, near um, Vergennes. That was named for him. That's where his his fleet uh, uh, during the bat the battle after Valcour Island, uh, he ran his fleet aground the boats he had left and burnt them there in what's now called Arnold Bay. So that's the one place I thought it was the one place in the whole country named for him. But there's also an Arnold Lake I think up in Canada that his men had um, passed through on their way to over to Quebec. That's also uh, still remains, but every, there's no uh, there's no Benedict Arnold Jr. High or anything like that. Okay, our last question for the afternoon comes from James Thornton. And it's kind of asking for you to do some speculative history here, Jack, because I know you've already said uh, your final answer on this question is I don't know, but it's asking about Arnold's reasons for turning over. So the question is, could part of Arnold's decision to aid the British maybe be based on Arnold's lack of trust or confidence in patriot and future U.S. leaders? And future U.S. Leaders. Leaders. Um, well, one thing that is a, a little bit confusing about the, 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 that qu question from that perspective is Arnold made contact with the British in, uh, I think, in the spring of uh, 1779, when he uh, he had not, was not yet in command at, at uh, uh, West Point, but he started talking to them and going back and forth secretly with Andre and uh, Henry Clinton, who was then a British commander. Uh, those negotiations and how much was he going to get paid to to compensate him for his losses and so forth went on and and what could he give them that was they he wanted to give them and they of course wanted him to to hand over the biggest prize that they could and they all they thought West Point was that's what West Point was and it took quite a while so it wasn't until uh i think about 16 months later that the fru the plot came to its fruition in in 1780 in 1779, uh, the Patriots were doing pretty well. The, there was not an awful lot of fighting then. By 1780, the the, um, the it looked like the Patriot cause was in deep trouble. They'd lost 
uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, they uh, General Gates had gone down there and lost the Battle of Camden, was really badly defeated. Uh, they were running out of money. They had very little credit. The French alliance didn't seem to be helping them much. Um, so you could say Benedict Arnold was looking to get on the winning side. He was he wanted to get with the British because it looked like the British going to win the war. But I don't think that was the case because he had started his treason back when uh, the British were not didn't look like they're necessarily going to win the war. Or the the de Patriots going to be defeated. Um, so I think that his his looking into the future was um, was hard. You know, it's not a it's not something you could say one way or the other. What did he imagine that this was going to help him? Uh, he thought that he was doing the right thing by ending the war. So I would imagine he he lo th thought of himself as being the hero. He was going to end the war by helping the British get back in control. Everything would go back to the way it was. Uh, and he would be considered a hero for uh, not only for fighting, but for for having brought an end to the war. Uh, but again, it's very hard to figure out what he was thinking. To me, uh, I just I found him very enig enigmatic, uh, and he himself was not a introspective person. He was very he did not think about what he was thinking about. He just did things uh sort of on the spur of the moment so um i think it's always going to be a great element of mystery thanks jack okay if everyone can stand for just one minute um i'm going to put some links in the chat box so you can go straight to our online store to purchase jack's book and um john devineau also has an announcement about the next lecture series program yeah, thank you, Angie. Uh, just before the, I may, uh, talk about the next uh, program, I, if, in my introduction, I mentioned that Jack has appeared on C-SPAN. Yesterday, I just did a Google search. I put in C-SPAN Jack Kelly, and I ran across a talk he gave a while back on the Erie Canal called Heaven's Ditch, God, Gold, and Murder on the Erie Canal. And I would highly recommend that you take some time to go back and, and uh, take a look at it because I, I knew a little bit about the Erie Canal, but the amount of new information that was presented in that talk was amazing. So check it out. Just Google C-SPAN Jack Kelly and you will find it. Um, our next talk is on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. And in honor of St. Patrick, our speaker is Joe Bruchak, who is an Ab Abnaki poet. Uh, lives over in the Hudson River Valley also. So let it not be said that the homestead just hones in on uh, the Revolutionary War, right? So uh, it promises to be another very exciting talk. So this one also will be on Zoom in February, in uh, March. Come April, we'll be back with our talks at the homestead. So thank you all for coming. Uh, March. Uh, John, the talk in March is also half musical presentation. Is that correct? Uh, I believe, yeah, it's, it's going to be Joe and his son also are going, and they're going to be doing some uh, poetry, apparently, even in Abnaki, so uh, probably with English subtitles. I don't know. We, we'll have to figure out how that works, but it promises to be a very unique and, uh, and an informative talk. Uh, so please join us on March 17th. You'll get appropriate notices if you were here uh, today. Thank you all for coming, and I think we will uh, we'll sign off. Thank you, Jack. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody.